Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, and good morning to those of you in the room. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to those of you who are watching virtually, depending where you are or when you're watching this. Uh, my name is Jay Shep. I'm the director of the Institute of International Economic Policy here at UW, or IIEP, as we call it. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are a cross-school interdisciplinary research center that supports economic research in um, areas around globalization and international economic policy. It's a mandate we interpret pretty broadly. So we cover international trade, international finance, international development, poverty studies, climate change, economic policy more broadly. And in particular, um, we have had an emphasis on the economics around China and US-China economic relationship, as well as the economy of India. Um, I wanna thank um, those uh, members of our executive circle who may be in attendance, especially virtually, for their support uh, of IAP. Um, I wanted to say really quickly about this event. Um, as it, you see here, this is the 14th annual China Conference Series. It is our longest running series that we have. It's something that IAP has been doing since its founding, is hosting major conferences on US, China, and China's economy in particular. Um, and so that's something that we've kept doing. Sometimes we've done those as very large in-person conferences. For the last two years, it's been more of a series, but we're really thrilled that today we can have back-to-back -back in person episodes to kind of close this series um, in a way a little bit more like we used to do, where we would have a large group together. So um, again, I want to thank uh, our organizers of this series, uh, Maggie Chen and Chao Wei, who have done a huge amount of work to get everyone um, in, into place over the last uh, two years, really. Um, and now, though, I want to turn things over to our first moderator uh, for today, Barbara Stallings, who is an IEP Distinguished Visiting Scholar, among other things, um, and let Barbara introduce, introduce uh, this morning's event and speak. So, Barbara. Right. So good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for being here in person or online. And welcome to um, the current version of the China conference here at IIEP. We have two outstanding keynote speakers this morning. The first is Dr. Yan Zhong Wong, one of the world's leading experts on global health in general and China's health policy in particular. He's going to speak on China's rebranding campaign during the COVID-19 pandemic. How successful is it? Just wanted to check to make sure he hadn't changed his title since the last time I saw it. Um, after his lecture, we'll have responses from two knowledgeable discussants. I'm going to introduce Dr. Wang now, and then I'll introduce the two discussants later before their presentations. I suspect that Yan Zhong Wang probably doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, I'm sure that most of you have seen him on television or on podcasts recently um, discussing the pandemic. But let me add to what you may already know. Dr. Wong is a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he directs the Global Health Governance Roundtable Series. He's also a professor and director of global health studies at Seton Hall's um, School of Diplomacy and International Relations. And he's the founding editor of the journal Global Health Governance. He's written extensively on China and global health and is the author of two books. First one is Governing Health in Contemporary China, published in 2013. And then Toxic Politics, China's Environmental Health Crisis and its Challenge to the Chinese State, published in 2020. He, of course, has also published numerous reports, journal articles, book chapters, etc. He obtained his BA and MA from Fudan University in Shanghai and his PhD from the University of Chicago. Welcome to the podium, Dr. Wang. Thank you, Barbara, for that uh, very uh, generous introduction and uh, thanks for. IEP and of course Carl uh, for organizing this event and also for inviting me here. So it's really a pleasure to be back. This is my second trip uh, to DC this week. 
uh, so easy come easy go <laughs> um, yeah uh, so and for those who are participating uh, virtually and for those who are participating in person good morning uh, thank you for uh, participating in today's event um, well today I'm going to talk about China's rebranding campaign during the COVID-19 pandemic basically uh, examine this rebranding efforts, but also how successful it is. So uh, I'm going to first talk about China's uh, initial relative success in controlling the spread of COVID-19, and then you know, talk about some of the main themes of Beijing's rebranding campaign uh, after uh, it managed to control the uh, Wuhan outbreak. Uh, then I'm going to um, assess how effective like, this uh, campaign is, and also followed up by, uh, by a discussion on U.S. response to Beijing's rebranding campaigns and how what that means for U.S. global health leadership. Well, <laughs> we're still in the pandemic, but it's even more striking that after more than two years, scientists are still debating when, where, how the pandemic started. Amazing. Right? Uh, and uh, if you look at the China's response to the outbreak, right, that it uh, was to be fair, right, compared to its response to the SARS outbreak 2002-2003, it was actually quite uh, responsive. You know, it took um, uh, China more than three months to decisively, formally respond to the SARS outbreak, but they took the country only 25 days, I say only 25 days, uh, comparatively speaking, uh, only 25 days to, uh, since the alarm first sounded. China to um, respond swiftly, decisively uh, to the outbreak. And, uh, and of course, right, the way President Xi Jinping uh, the, uh, ordered the lockdown of Wuhan January 22nd, you know, that after he learned about the human to human uh, transmission of the virus, right, that, that policy U turn initially right, the spawned chaos, right, the, uh, uh, and our coordination problems, you know, that led to you know, some of the journalists right, or China watchers consider that the China's Chernobyl movement right, indicated that was going to lead to political reform or even regime collapse. But uh, again, but the uh, government uh, show its capacity to beat the odds right, uh, by showing by right, this tremendous capacity to mobilize the resources capacity for high priority actions right so within like uh, uh, a very short period of time like we constructed many like, hospitals by like, admitting you know, those infections and also uh, launched, of course, the lockdown of Wuhan and beyond. Uh, the, uh, and in the meantime, used like, the uh, grid management uh, uh, tools and also the high tech means, including big data, you know, the, uh, um, the cell phones to basically monitor right, the people's movements to enforce effectively those quarantine measures. So this measure has turned out to be very successful in turning the tide. You know, and so uh, essentially, you know, um, if you look at this um, uh, chart, this, this figure, right? Um, Mid-February 2020, right? The, uh, the cases began to drop uh, uh, significantly, right? The, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, okay, but this is the, the January 23rd, right? The lockdown of Wuhan, February 5th, so started the operation of the so called Fang Chang, which is sort of like a makeshift quarantine center or shelter hospitals, right? 
So for mid-February, solid cases uh, dropped in you know, significantly. And uh, uh, in early April, like China lifted the, the, uh, the lockdown on um, Wuhan. Uh, and uh, um, since then, you know, they were able to maintain extremely low level of infection in the country. In fact, between April 2020 and December 2021, you know, the everyday daily new uh, new case count rarely exceed 100 for, for a country with 1.4 billion people. You know that's quite an achievement. Um, so, but, but interestingly, right, there's there's also the time you know, that uh, saw what like, international opinion on China become right, increasingly negative. So according to a Tsinghua University study on international opinion on China, by using this uh, uh, Twitter messages right, uh, the, uh, to uh, determine which one is more negative, which one is positive, you know, they found uh, that uh, the, there's a significant increase in negative opinion of China you know, after March 2020, you know, that when you saw discussions, you know, China's COVID outbreak, become increasingly dominated by issues related to Chinese politics and foreign policy like during the crisis. You know, so that was the background of the launch of the rebranding campaign, right? Uh, which essentially, according to New York Times, that analyzed the, the tweets right, uh, of the state media and the Chinese diplomats right, uh, in March 2020, you know, they found essentially three themes. You know, one, you know, the, uh, this new uh, rebranding campaign uh, sought to promote China's response to the outbreak as a model for the rest of the world. And secondly, they want to highlight the role of China as a leader in providing global public goods, including vaccines and PPE. Right? Uh, and, and third, they want to dispute but that China was the origin of the pandemic. So these are the three major themes of the rebranding campaign. Uh, so first of all, right, let's talk about this, the, uh, this efforts to uh, promote the Chinese response to the outbreak as a model for the rest of the world. Like China uh, started to promote an uh, optimistic view of the far, its fight against the COVID-19. Um, the, the officials and nationalist intellectuals started to encourage other countries to sort of cock and paste you know, the, the homework finished by China. That uh, I remember in March uh, 2020, I participated in you know, like a uh, online uh, meeting. You know, this attended by the Chinese intellectuals. There's one like uh, uh, leading like think tank uh, scholar. She was like wondering, you know, like, why the foreign countries cannot copy our you know, model. Why cannot they use you know, our traditional Chinese medicine, which is so effective in, uh, in uh, containing right, the, the, uh, the, the transmission? And if you look at the coverage of China, well, this is again as part of this promotion campaign, where right, you can compare the media tone right, from the Chinese sources and uh, that from all other sources, but right, this is the Actually, the uh, data based on like 1.3 million uh, English statements from more than 365,000 news articles from more than 100 countries. Right, they can tell, right? Those coverage on China, right, from Chinese sources and those from other countries. You can see clearly, right, that, that uh, this this coverage, right, from the Chinese sources are much more. Are positive, you know, than other sources. Right, that between January two thousand two, well, actually, starting January twenty twenty and through uh, January twenty twenty one. And uh, there were also efforts. Right, this is the second theme, right, to frame China as a leader in providing global public goods. Right, the first society in right, March uh, twenty twenty, the so called mask diplomacy. Right. By providing PPEs uh, to the rest of the world. In fact, that during 2020, China's total PPP uh, exports surged more than threefold over the previous year. Right? Uh, 
the other top global producers of PPE, including Germany, USA, Japan, France, but did not even see similar increase in exports, right? That, that, that you see how, you know, this is a dramatic increase of the Chinese PPE exports. Uh, in fact, in 2020, China supplied 43% of the global, uh, the 43% of the global imports of PPE compared with 21% in 2019, the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi said, "Well, China took the lead by building a global anti-epidemic defense." And then this is followed by the vaccine diplomacy, right? That started in May 2020 when President Xi Jinping promised to make Chinese vaccines a global public good, right? Uh, and by mid-March 2021, China already had produced about one-third of the world's vaccine doses, become the largest right, vaccine exporter in the world. In fact, this is the more recent data, according to President Xi, as of late April by 2020, I think this is April 2020, April 20, just a couple of days ago, right, Beijing, uh, they announced they had provided more than 2.1 billion doses of vaccines to 420 countries. Okay. Uh, so in contrast to the vaccine nationalism in the West, uh, China's vaccine diplomacy promised to mitigate by the sort of vaccine apartheid, right? The global disparities in vaccine access and establish China's image as a responsible and reliable global power, especially in low and middle income countries. Right? And uh, certainly by Chinese state and social media frame this uptake of Beijing's vaccine as a clear sign of China's global leadership. And I remember this one think tank, you know, uh, uh, um, scholar like the tweeted, well, not tweeted, the new the, the, uh, posted it, you know, in, in WeChat say Chinese vaccines are taking over the whole world. Very proud of it. The third theme is to dispute the regions of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, right? In fact, before the end of, prior to uh, the end of February 2020, after China possibly acknowledged it was a region of the pandemic. But the beginning early March 2020, China started to officially contain uh, the pandemic was never proven to have originated in the country. Right? And of course, right, the, uh, this fight over the pandemic's origins became more contentious you know, when top U.S. diplomats, right, including uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo you know, and the, the Trump administration, I mean, Trump himself, increasingly linked the virus to China by right, using this term, um, either like uh, the Kung Fu flu, you know, China Chinese viruses, right? Uh, uh, and, and since May 2021, in a way that uh, um, Thesis, right, under the lab leak theory, right, became sort of like a legitimate explanation, by right, the, um, the, the hypothesis on the origin of the pandemic, China actually has doubled down, right, on the campaign to portray uh, that the U.S. military lab in Fort Detrick, you know, as the origin of the pandemic, you know, so, and I think today, if you ask, you know, that is actually quite successful, right, uh, but only for domestic consumption. If you ask like ordinary Chinese, like where well, <laughs> this pandemic started, you know, very likely you could get an answer from the United States. So that leads to our question: How successful is Beijing's rebranding campaign? Right? You know that if you look at what well, this is the objectives, one they want to improve their image, right, internationally. You know, actually, initially that was quite successful, according to a Pew, you know, World Attitude Survey. Uh, the percentage of respondents across 14 OECD countries, uh, they, uh, those who were saying China had done a good job addressing the pandemic, uh, actually increased from a median of only 31% in summer 2020, actually to close to 50% in spring uh, 2021. You know, uh, that compared with a median of only 37% who said the same thing on the United States. Right? Uh, so, you know, the, those who say, the, the, who held positive, right, uh, the uh, um, 
uh, the opinion by um, Beijing's response to the pandemic action exists not just in the developing world, but even in the developer world as well. Right? And the aim of those analysis is by a close to 600 unique mass diplomacy events across 158 countries. They found actually China's mass diplomacy actually worked to offset the reputational damage to China uh, during the pandemic. Um, and according to a study by International Federal Federation of Journalists in May 2021, the countries that were recipients of China's COVID-19 vaccines uh, in 2020, right, they were like, more likely to support China's narrative by right, on its pandemic response, you know, but less likely to support Western's uh, narrative you know, on the uh, uh, China's uh, um, pandemic response. So like those who are recipients of Chinese vaccines, 63% are going to say China's fast action against COVID-19 has helped other countries you know, as has its medical diplomacy, right? And only 23 say China's cover up of the initial outbreak is the reason for global nature of the outbreak, right? They compare that to those non-recipient countries, right? Oh, uh, uh, the, uh, only 25% say China's fast action against COVID-19 has helped other countries as has its medical diplomacy, but 60% say uh, China's cover up of the initial outbreak is the reason for global nature of the outbreak. Right? Um, of course, there are variations, right? That the, a media tone about China and the pandemics is most appellative in Africa, you know, followed by Asia, of course, excluding China, but it is most negative in the Americas, Europe, and Oceania. And also, like the, on the politics side, China's COVID diplomacy also enabled it to advance its other foreign policy objectives. Right? The, uh, in fact, uh, immediately before or after receiving Chinese vaccines, you know, many countries reaffirmed their support for Beijing's positions in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang. Right? The, uh, there's sometimes you know, this support is the result of a quick pro quo diplomacy. Right? In Brazil, for example, two weeks after um, it's the communication minister right, asked for Chinese vaccines, right? they, um, then uh, the country made a policy U-turn and allowed Huawei you know, to you know, participate in its 3G auctions. And in Nicaragua, you know, China's vaccine diplomacy scored a huge victory by December 2021, you know, when the country severed its diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. But four days later, you know, they welcomed the first batch of the 1 million donated vaccines from China. But okay, on the negative side, uh, since the summer of 2021, especially you know, since the Shanghai you know, lockdown, we found that international reverence for Beijing's zero COVID approach has decreased rapidly, significantly. Right? This, if you look at this, is the Wuhan, in terms of the cases, this is the Wuhan outbreak. When you look at the Shanghai, right, this since. Uh, uh, end of March 2022, right, uh, the Shanghai outbreak, the cases numbers have been, was being like five, six times of that of the Wuhan outbreak. But the, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the even worse, right, the, uh, the local government's poor handling of the outbreak has hurt for China's soft power. The uh, uh, you know this, this horror stories of you know families being separated, right? Uh, you know the uh, elderly people in their nineties being dragged you know, to a quarantine center. You know the uh, people are starving. You know and uh, 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 protesting. Right? The uh, these stories were shared internationally. Right that, that led people to question right that the uh, effectiveness of the so-called China model, right uh, the pandemic response. You know? uh, that you know I found this conversation, this transcript 
of a German expat in Shanghai, you normally would think that these people they choose to live in China because they love the country, right? But uh, you know, uh, this guy apparently was so upset that he would be asked to uh, to do the quarantine, even though he was tested negative, right? Uh, he was you know, basically this country is a joke. It's seriously a joke. Uh, when this, this in, in, in the background, there's this woman's voice who said, global glory for China. She was he just mocked as a global glory. This is a disgrace for this country. Yes, any third world country would do this better than this. This is really, really, really shameful. I, you got a sense, you know, how mad the people are, even for those who traditionally, right, they who hold you know, positive, held positive opinions on the country. And even more interestingly, right, normally when you say this kind of things in China, people would immediately, right, they got very mad, you know, that, that they, but, you know, look at the follow-up comments, you know, many people actually agree with you, you know. Um, so with this is the, uh, it, it's just an indication, right, of how you know, that moral, right, that is now increasingly, right, questioned, right, uh, internationally. Um, and also, if you look at China's COVID-19 diplomacy, mass diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy, right, even though uh, it is expecting some policy wins, but Beijing did not make significant new roads in forging, in forging new political and strategic relationship uh, uh, during the, uh, the pandemic, uh, the, according to a, a study conducted by the Center of Strategic International Studies. Uh, they say you know, they found that the effect of China's COVID diplomacy was most significant in countries you know, where uh, China you know, already had strong geopolitical influence. So they really did not make any uh, um, uh, make any roads by enforcing new political strategic relationships. You know, in fact, uh, if you look at the, this uh, survey that was conducted released earlier this year. Uh, by uh, the um, the uh, Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, they did this annual study by the survey, you know, the policy elites in Southeast Asian countries. Right? They found that even though China was the most generous right, <laughs> among all the major powers in providing COVID-related assistance to the region, but China is still the least trusted right, in the region. Right? Fifty-eight percent of them say, you know, China. Uh, was they said they didn't have confidence in China, right? They compared to uh, uh, with the close to thirty percent, right, for the United States. And they also look at the, the Beijing's by efforts to uh, frame it as a leader in global um, public uh, providing global public goods, right? Uh, in practicing you know mask and vaccine diplomacy. Actually, only a proportion, a portion of what Beijing shipped overseas was considered grant assistance or donations. In fact, only 1% of the PPE exports was donations, and only less than 10% of the committed vaccines actually grant assistance compared to the United States. But almost all the right that these uh, our vaccine, um, uh, the uh, um, the um, it's the vaccines we uh, we committed overseas actually are donations. Right? Uh, so this is actually challenged by the, this 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 idea, right? That this this claim in you know, China's a leader of global public goods because by definition, my right, public goods should be non rivalrous and non excludable, right? But the, in most of the Chinese action sent overseas actually are commercial supplies. And in some cases, they're even more expensive you know, than Western ones. And you look at, well, I forgot to mention this figure, right? The, the, this chart there, they uh, uh, donated to like 7 million uh, doses right, to Africa, where many of those Chinese traditional allies were, right? The, uh, but you know, consider why right, in Africa, more than well, actually 1.2 billion population in the country, right? And with a two dose regimen, right? The 70 million, right? Uh, uh, not only able to cover actually less than 3% of the region's population. 
And the relatively low efficacy rates of the Chinese in activated vaccines, of course, that led some countries to move away from like, the Chinese vaccines beginning by summer in summer of last year, right? The, uh, uh, especially with the emergence of uh, um, the Delta variant and then, of course, the Omicron variant. You know, in fact, uh, you know, when uh, this, uh, uh, the, this the survey I, I asked, you know, this the policy elite's opinion, right? Uh, uh, the, the, the South in East Asia, Southeast Asia, right? They, they ask the policy elites' opinion on what is the, the most trusted vaccine brand. Right? Um, they found fifty-five percent say Pfizer and Moderna. Right? Only nineteen percent say they favor Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccine. And the even more interesting, right? If you look at this chart here on the distribution and delivery of the Chinese vaccines worldwide, right? Between December 2020 and March 2022, right? But there's a significant well, overall increase of the, the uh, Chinese delivery of the vaccines worldwide and peaked in October 2021. And then you saw this tra dramatic decline of the delivery of the Chinese vaccine worldwide. And actually, by March 2022, it's almost become like a zero uh, in the delivery of the Chinese vaccines. So that leads, you know, uh, lead, lead, lead some people to question: Why is that? Does that mean this is the end of Chinese vaccine diplomacy? Okay. And then the third theme, right? The, the origins probe, right? We know, right, that. that uh, you know, now the investigation on the origins of the pandemic has entered an impasse, right? The, uh, the window of, uh, uh, in terms of biological feasibility of uh, conducting probe uh, is rapidly, you know, is, uh, uh, is closing very rapidly. I think, you know, I can say confidently, we may never find the, uh, the cause of the outbreak, you know, the, the pandemic, right? The, uh, but uh, um, what well, initially, well, again, well, this this effort is, was actually quite, is quite successful, right? They, even though China was unable to prevent the WHO from kicking off this phase one of the pandemic origins probe by right, beginning in May 2020, right? That it actually gained a clear upper hand in negotiation with the WHO on the terms and timing of the investigation. You know, the after you know the uh, this the uh, WHO team stayed in China, you know, for in early, in early in the spring, in early spring last year. Uh, they uh, they come up with a report that is considered right, a PR victory uh, for Beijing because that report essentially supported by right, that natural zoonotic spillover theory, legitimized the uh, claim you know, that uh, the COVID nineteen you know could have reached China. Uh, through imported frozen food, that sounds a very novel hypothesis, right? And, and also, why right, they dismissed it, right, the theory that the virus has escaped from a lab in Wuhan, right? So this is considered right, a big PR victory for uh, uh, China. But in the meantime, uh, Beijing's efforts to reshape the narrative on the origins of the pandemic also confirm the limits of its the leverage over the, uh, the WHO. In fact, uh, um, the, uh, in mid-July 2021, uh, WHO Director General Tedros outlined the terms of the, uh, the probe's next phase and asked China uh, to be, quote unquote, be transparent, open and cooperate, especially on information, raw data that we asked for at the early days of the pandemic. Uh, and on February 5th, this is the most recent information, uh, the, uh, Tedros actually discussed with the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang uh, uh, on the need for what he consider stronger collaboration on the origins of the COVID-19, indicating China uh, could be more cooperative, right? Uh, in a way that they show on the uh, pandemic origins probe. You know? So uh, there's you know, this souring of the relationship between China and WHO indicating that Beijing's overplaying uh, in the origins probe as backfire. So what is the US response? 
prior to the pandemic, the United States was an undisputed global health leader. The two Washingtons, right? Washington, the U.S. government here, and the the, uh, the Gates Foundation, in, uh, Washington State, right? They contribute the majority of the global health fund. Uh, and then, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has undermined international trust in the U.S. global health leadership. You know, the U.S. was among the poorest performance in responding to the pandemic domestically. Right? The, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, I think China correctly pointed out you know, that our pandemic response might turn out to be a much more divisive and uh, deadly process. And internationally, the Trump administration essentially abdicated the U.S. global leadership right, by, you know, the uh, severing its relationship with the WHO and then becoming increasingly concerned about China's global health leadership, right, calling WHO, you know, China-centric. Right? And under Biden, right, the, I think the initial right, the, the response seems to be encouraging, by right, the uh, this fast, expensive vaccine rollout promised to help the United States reassert leadership in pandemic control. It also began to move away from vaccine nationalism, uh, to become a global supply of COVID-19 vaccines. And in the meantime, they launched its own vaccine diplomacy seeking to neutralize by China's expanding international food. But the Biden administration by is not grappling with the shifting domestic international reality that makes reasserting US global leadership more difficult than ever, right? Uh, this dilemma of responding to a global pandemic and navigating the domestic politics right, was evidenced by the administration's inability to achieve high domestic vaccine rate and to significantly improve global vaccine equity. Right, the, even today, you know, we still haven't reached a 70% right, the poor vaccination rate nationwide compared with China's close to 90% vaccination rate. And globally, right, the, you know, that the, uh, most of the global health experts are, were, are pe pessimistic, you know, were able to reach the 70% uh, vaccination target, right, uh, uh, that WHO set, right, the, uh, for um, uh, the uh, uh, the in, uh, the uh, for vaccinating the world right, by uh, September uh, this year. So, and instead, also when we are focusing on countering China's influence, we are forsaking the efforts to cooperate with China in global pandemic response. Right? In December last year, we published a uh, report, we offered this report uh, titled Advancing US-China Health Security Cooperation in the Era of Strategic Competition. Basically, we're saying, well, even though we're strategic competitors, but in like the Cold year, World Era, we could still cooperate right, on global health security. Right? This is in the US interest. But unfortunately, right, that on both sides, but it's included, but especially on the US side, there's no basically interest right, in even starting a serious discussion with China on this issue. And all our calls you know, on cooperating with China, on you know, stabilizing the global supply chain, you know, on the uh, uh, development and distribution of vaccines that therapeutic means, on easing the travel and trade restriction measures, essentially don't work right, in Washington. Now, I think this is really unfortunate. Right? It's not in our interest. And uh, so <laughs> I'm going to conclude. I think I've been talking too much. Uh, so China's initial success in controlling COVID-19 coupled with the US failure to mount a speedy and effective pandemic response actually uh, helped China's rebranding efforts right, in, in the pursuit of global ambitions. But still, right, the, uh, the China's rebranding efforts have so far achieved only mixed and a limited success on all the three fronts, right, in terms of uh, the promoting China's image as an effective uh, respond, uh, responder to the uh, global pandemic, right, 
to uh, frame it as a global leader providing right, this, the, uh, the uh, global public goods and also disputing the origins of the pandemic. Uh, China's vulnerability in maneuvering for global health leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic will present the United States an opportunity to advance its leadership agenda. Uh, um, but the, the Biden administration so far does not seem to have been fully taking advantage of that vulnerability. You know, help, uh, I hope it can do a better job uh, in this coming by like, second uh, global COVID-19 summit in May, yeah, but uh, you never know. So with that, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting and a very complete um, talk. I'm sure that will give us many things to, um, to talk about in the discussion. Um, but before opening to a general discussion, um, I want to introduce our two official discussants. Um, Joan Kaufman will be with us on Zoom. Um, I hope we'll be able to see her at some point. Um, Joan is a the New York-based director of academic programs for the Schwartz and Scholars Program at Tsinghua University, which both Dr. Wong and I are also involved in. A um, bit of a reunion here. Um, Joan is also a lecturer in global health and social medicine at the Harvard Medical School and teaches global health policy at the Schwarzman Program. Dr. Kaufman has lived and worked in China for 15 years during the period beginning um, in 1980, very early on, um, affiliated with the United Nations, the Ford Foundation, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and Columbia University. She holds a PhD in public health from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and a BA and MA in China Studies. With us today is um, Zoe McLaren, Associate Professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and an affiliate of the Health Econometrics and Data Group at York University. Dr. McLaren is a health economist whose research informs health and economic policy to combat infectious disease epidemics, including HIV, tuberculosis, and COVID-19, both in the United States and abroad. She received a PhD in public policy and economics from the University of Michigan, a BA from Dartmouth College, and was a visiting scholar here at IIT um, several years ago. Um, if we can get Joan on the screen, we can have her presentation and then uh, followed by Zoe up here in person. Very good. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks very much. I'm delighted to be a discussant for Yan Zhong, who's a close colleague of many years and who I always learn so much from. And as Barbara mentioned, you know, is also faculty for us at Schwartzman uh, College at Tsinghua, um, and who I co-taught co with for a number of years. Um, and I'm sorry not to be with you in person. Um, and my comments today are going to be really much more from my own perspective from public health and science. And, um, and I'm going to focus on the three uh, areas that Yan Zhong uh, raised today. So first on the efforts to promote China's pandemic response models, you know, it's looking pretty bad at the moment, um, given the Shanghai outbreak and the handling of that. Um, and um, especially, you know, looking China's own failures to actually vaccinate its own elderly, um, I think only about 50% are, are vaccinated, is really going to turn the narrative into in a fairly bad direction as it already is happening. Um, you know, you can understand China's zero COVID policy and its reluctance to give it up at this point. Um, uh, which they've been touting has been have been as being so successful the last few years, um, but at this point, with you know such the demographics of the country, so many el so many people, so many elderly, um, you know, Shanghai has like twenty three point four percent of its population over sixty years old. That's like five point eight two million people. Even if just two percent of those. And many of those have non-communicable diseases and the other kind of risk factors for COVID. 
only 50% of the elderly are vaccinated, even if just 2% get sick, it's going to really overwhelm the health system. So, you know, China's in a pickle at the moment because they're the other narrative that's going south for them is, you know, not all vaccines are the same. And even while they have had quite a bit of success in making vaccines accept, accept, accessible to the world through their vaccine diplomacy, um, you know, those vaccines are turning out to be the least effective of all the vaccines that are out there. So, you know, where China has to go at this point is really um, looking at how to vaccinate their elderly probably with a more uh, uh, effective mRNA or, you know, a global vaccine. Uh, and for, you know, many reasons, um, I think have been unwilling to do that. Plus, you know, the, the failures in the West uh, to make those technologies widely available as a global public good rather than protecting the patents and the intellectual property um, you know, are, um, are not helping the case. So I think China's really in a difficult spot at the moment. The narrative is going very south. Um, and, you know, China's always playing to its own domestic audience. The uh, support um, for China's own successes is largely pitched to, you know, uh, creating more nationalism support for the party. Um, and um, as we can see from what's happening in Shanghai, there's a lot of negative narrative happening at the moment. Um, and how that turns around in the short term, I think is going to determine where the narrative ends up. You know, China's pulled it out of the, the you know, trash heap before and turned it around, especially early in the pandemic. So. Um, you know, what happens next, I think, will be very important for us to watch. Um, you know, and next, I really wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, you know, China framing itself as a leader in the provision of global public goods. Um, China definitely took the opportunity with, you know, on the vaccine equity issue. Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, it really was a soft power victory for China, also with the PPE provisions um, in the early days. So, you know, like many of us who work in China, I had got, uh, you know, reached out from many of my colleagues saying, do you need masks, you know, and kind of sending me uh, large quantities of masks, you know, from my little world to, you know, just distribute in my own community. And I think, you know, it was a real sort of total focus outreach effort to um, depict China as, uh, you know, um, the provider of pub global public goods for the world. Um, and, but now, you know, as I said, not all vaccines are equal. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the PR has really been focused on how ineffective, um, you know, these killed vaccines um, the Sinovac and uh, Sinopharm and all its derivatives, including the one that's being used in Hong Kong are, you know, so um, I think part of the discussion has represented a kind of a lack of understanding the vaccine field about what works and doesn't work, and not all vaccines are the same. And I think the larger, you know, revision in history is going to really look at, um, you know, how, um, you know, how the more effective vaccines are distributed um, and um, and I also think that the the you know the as bad as the U.S. response was in the beginning, the countries like um, you know New Zealand, China, Hong Kong, which really tried to keep COVID out, um, are really suffering these wide outbreaks right now. And um, the understanding of where we are in this pandemic that you know the combination of effective vaccine plus herd immunity. Um, through infection is really going to be the way forward for the global pandemic, um, you know, living with the pandemic, living with, with um, COVID. Um, and um, how those, all those countries get there uh, is going to be what I think the, the public PR will be much more about um, success in managing that, which China is not doing very a good job of at the moment. Um, and then, um, Finally, I just want to just make a, a point about the effort to dispute the COVID-19 origins. Um, you know, so um, I, I do think, I think one of the things that's puzzled me as a sort of scientist, public health person, is that 
for those of us who've worked on, you know, emerging infectious diseases in China and elsewhere, you know, this, this, it's always been obvious that this is a, you know, a jumping of a live animal virus from species to people. It's not the first time. And um, it's, you know, it's, we've had SARS, avian flu, many others. And actually uh, recently a study that was published in Science just identified you know, a, a study from Nanjing Agri Agricultural University uh, looked at like 2000 animals that are that in China and the live animal markets and um, did a study of sort of 18 different species and identified 102 virus species from 13 different viral families that have the potential to jump from animals to humans, um, and they deemed 21 of those as high risk uh, to humans. Um, and so, because they'd infected people in the past. So it's just a question of time before the next one happens. And I think for those of us who looked at the history of these emerging infectious diseases in China, it's obvious this was a jump from, you know, from, um, you know, from animals to people. And um, I, I guess I have, have been, you know, puzzled in a way that um, the discussion became so geopolitical as opposed to just scientific and that China didn't even do a good job itself of, of pushing um, that narrative vigorously enough, um, the scientific narrative, um, and that the Wuhan lab theory leak has had so much you know, uh, press time, I would say, and has dominated the discussion. So um, I just, you know, there are it's, I think it's just important that, um, you know, and I think science is converging on the live animal um, theory now, um, but the PR on it will always live on. Um, so I think I'm just gonna stop there and just say that, um, you know, I think we're at a point now where the narrative is quickly changing um, given current events and what happens next is gonna be critical for how history sees all these issues. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Zoe McLaren. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So uh, China had um, early success with zero COVID. Uh, the question is at what cost early on and is it sustainable? So um, we've already talked about the food shortages and social unrest um, in Shanghai right now. So a reminder of the large costs of this type of zero COVID policy. And obviously there were the large costs early on in the pandemic, but a little less obvious when most countries are kind of doing these large scale lockdowns. And I think people's memory is pretty short when it comes to pandemic policy. We're only partway through 2022, but 2021 and 2020 seem like a really long time ago. So we can't really um, rely on past success uh, to justify what we're doing now. Really, um, countries are demanding that their leaders adapt to changing situations and also to changing willingness to engage in pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, regulations and restrictions. So the question of whether China can export this zero COVID model. So first of all, many countries do not have the uh, political will or the population, the demand to either implement or sustain this type of response. Um, it may have worked in China, unclear whether it would work elsewhere. Many countries began with a weak initial response and certain countries that had a strong initial response um, are suffering right now and have, have um, relaxed a lot of their policies. And I think one of the concerns is there is a big risk to this zero COVID policy. So Hong Kong is a good example uh, to show how risky it is. They had very good policy and then we have um, seen uh, these are um, deaths per million people, so adjusting for the population size. You can see this major spike in Hong Kong recently after keeping deaths relatively low. So zero COVID can work, but if it fails, it fails in a major way and can be really detrimental to for the political leaders um, and cause a lot of deaths all at once, major surges. So pandemic fatigue is real. 
engaging in uh, the, the restrictions that we engage in to prevent the spread of COVID, reduce social activity, um, and can really wear on the population. And so this idea about moving away from the types of, uh, of regulations that involve a lot of human behavior change and towards things that are more passive, such as improving ventilation and things like that, that allow us to get back to normal. I think that really is the way of the future. Um, vaccination, obviously a big one about that. It's kind of a bit of a one and done, although we are uh, involved in boosters. So it's kind of a booster a year, a booster every six months, and then you can kind of engage. Um, and beyond that, don't need to do anything um, uh, for the vaccines to work. Uh, ongoing masking, obviously there's, a, there's an ongoing cost to that. Things like ventilation and also doing surveillance through wastewater are ways that we can have the infrastructure uh, that does a lot of the work for us rather than us having to do things. If you imagine that we can just turn a tap on anywhere in this country and drink um, safe water, we take that for granted. Wouldn't it be great if we could breathe air indoors, outdoors, anywhere, and not have to think about it, not have to do anything and know that it would be safe. I think that is really the way of the future in terms of pandemic policy, rather than these major costly lockdowns in the Chinese model. Uh, vaccination rates are still lagging, not only among the elderly, but of course the highest risk population is among the elderly. There's also concerns about waning vaccine efficacy. So part of it is the efficacy um, immediately and whether boosters are likely to be needed. And so this prioritization uh, kind of purely keeping the economy open and not thinking about uh, health is going to lead to problems because you need a healthy population, healthy workers in order to keep the economy open. But more countries have been moving towards that, towards this balance between the trade-offs of uh, keeping people safe and uh, allowing people to engage in normal social activity and normal economic activity. If we just um, compare some of the vaccination rates so we're looking at this um, completing the initial protocol. That is a little bit misleading because the initial protocol, the effectiveness of that depends on the vaccine that you're receiving. Uh, but China has 86% of its population, this is this data, uh, vaccinated completing the initial protocol compared to the United States down at 66%. So it has done a much better job at vaccinating its population. Both China and the US have done a poor job in vaccinating their elderly, and we're starting to see uh, that affecting COVID. This is looking at the um, initial doses versus boosters. So China has done fairly well as with the boosters, continues to do the boosters. The um, Sinopharm and Sinovac look like they need more boosters on the mRNA vac vaccines that are more prevalent in the United States. Uh, but China is doing very well in terms, of, in terms of vaccination relative to the rest of the world. But with the zero COVID policy, they also have less um, infection acquired immunity. And so this isn't the whole picture here. If we look at boosters, um, if we look on the bottom right, the United States kind of tapped out in terms of boosters. Uh, they haven't been increasing, whereas China is still on this upward trajectory in terms of boosters. So part of that is due to the efficacy of the vaccines, but the mRNA vaccines also do have waning efficacy and boosters are required, especially for her, um, high risk populations. And so um, China is doing um, quite well um, and Hong Kong also in terms of um, boosters we have. So there is a very high economic cost to the zero COVID policy. It can be hard to quantify. It was harder to quantify early on in the pandemic when most countries were involved in these large lockdowns. But now we can look at other countries where COVID rates are low, vaccination rates are high, and the economy is open and functioning uh, relatively well. So that, in comparison to what is going on in China right now, really creates a stark so uh, there are shortages of food and other resources so that led to lockdown protests. And not only are people locked down, but they are running out of um, the resources of their basic needs. And so that is a reminder that the lockdown limits uh, mobility, but if it also results in people not having access to food, you're gonna have much bigger challenges. Uh, and then uh, because of the lockdown, the, uh, the statistic is 20% of the world's container ships are stuck in the harbor because of congested um, ports in Shanghai. So it's kind of doing detriment to the rest of the supply chain world, worldwide that these lockdowns do have kind of global repercussions. So we're talking about vaccine diplomacy and talking about soft power. Uh, if people are looking and, and wanting to blame China for some of the supply chain issues that we are all facing right now, that is really gonna undermine um, uh, the rebranding
And then it looks like the borders um, may remain sealed for the rest of 2022, which is a poor outlook for 2022 and also long-term. This idea about zero COVID means that you need to shut yourself off from the rest of the world. That is not very attractive um, as a policy and is going to um, just make China look bad but in comparison. So turning to the vaccine diplomacy. So a big component of vaccine diplomacy is how valuable are these vaccines and efficacy. So safety has been, uh, has been kind of well established. The question is efficacy and how quickly that wins. So the Chinese initially rejected the mRNA vaccines, which turned out to be more effective. Was that, um, was that sound policy or not? So they've developed two vaccines that do work, um, that they have been distributing worldwide, but they have lower efficacy than the mRNA vaccine. And I think part of it is also the perception of efficacy. So I'll show you some numbers in a second, but kind of people's perception is that these, um, that Sinovac and Sinopharm are kind of very low efficacy, whereas that's not necessarily the case, but perception matters a lot in terms of vaccines because it's very hard for individuals to um, ascertain directly how effective their own vaccine is because people who get vaccinated still um, can contract COVID. And does this positive attitude from vaccine diplomacy wane and would there be some regret about accepting these vaccines and then having um, more COVID outbreaks because they have lower efficacy? So this is data from the Financial Times. Um, so after three doses, Sinovac matches Pfizer's effectiveness, and this is for people um, age 60 and over in terms of mortality. So when we say lower efficacy, that's not necessarily true. It's, it's comparable, but only after three doses. And you can see after one dose or two dose, the, the light blue, that's Sinovac, higher mortality rates. So when we talk about efficacy, we do want to talk about uh, the kind of how many, how many forces, uh, how many uh, uh, doses are required. And also that reduces the, uh, the, the value of, an, of a single, single vaccine dose. And in terms of the outlook for vaccine diplomacy, I think China really is the only major player in that right now. Although the vaccination, the vaccine distribution has dropped down, the U.S. really has uh, checked out of this um, COVID international COVID aid in a lot of ways. Um, and there just is not the U.S. political will, not only for uh, domestic policy but also international. And then the COVAX initiative ended up being, I think, fundamentally unsuccessful. And so that, you know, a lot of the United States and Europe have put a lot of effort into that, um, and it just really came out short. Okay. Um, I want to start off by asking Young Jung if you want to comment on either Joan or Zoe's, any of their points that um, might be a good to start off. I 100% agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's very, fairly uh, like, uh, um, important uh, compliment. Uh, this, this things that I have not discussed, uh, but the Joe and uh, Zoe picked up, and I think I uh, really uh, think uh, very helpful. Okay, let's uh, move to an open discussion. Um, we can participate as well and pose questions, but let me see um, in the audience um, who would like to participate. And let me just ask a question, uh, I guess, of Kyle. Are we getting any questions through any Zoom? I will questions? translate those. Perfect, thank you. Okay, in the meantime, Stephen, please. Excellent, thank you very much. Why don't you say who you are so people will- Sure, my name is Stephen Kaplan. Uh, I'm an associate professor here in political science. I focus on issues of political economy and development. Um, and have regional focuses across China, Asia, as well as Latin America. Uh, so yeah, my question uh, reflects uh, one of the earlier charts you put up in terms of vaccine distribution. Uh, it was quite notable trend that decline in 2022. So of course I was puzzled and started thinking, okay, what explains uh, that, that fast decline? And of course we've heard some potential stories, including vaccine effectiveness, but I was wondering if you could comment on is this sort of an intentional decline? Um, you know, what might explain uh, this, decline, this decline, whether it's sort of intentional policy versus uh, some other structural shock? Great question. You know, that is the one hypothesis that, you know, this is so because of the uh, shortage of the uh, Chinese vaccine supply. 
But I don't think that's a problem because we know China has that the annual manufacturing capacity of 5 billion doses. So even though right, they have this strong demand you know, domestically, they still have enough to supply and, uh, globally. Uh, so I can only say so that is, has something to do with the emergence of the new highly transmissible variant you know, since last summer. Right? In fact, if you look at the, the time when they start this drop of the uh, this demand of the Chinese vaccine occurred in a way um, Delta variant become the dominant uh, strain uh, of uh, the, the virus spread in many countries. And it was also the time you know, that in the beginning of the summer of uh, 2021, we saw many countries, by including Indonesia, you know, including uh, uh, UAE, but they started to uh, move away from the Chinese vaccine when they started to, to kick off this booster shots uh, campaigns. You know, there it seems that there's a perception that uh, Chinese vaccine will not be um, that uh, effective in be, be, being used as a booster shots. But as Zoe pointed out, you know that uh, in fact when we talk about the three doses of the Chinese captive vaccines. It actually the efficacy rate is actually uh, as good as the MIA vaccines. This is an interesting point. Why I had never seen those data you had in your chart. So like, why are the Chinese not saying more about this? Because they don't want to talk about the initial differences, and they're in order to get to the the idea that at the, the booster it's equally effective. Or why would why does nobody know about this? Maybe it's just me that doesn't know about this. Well, that's, but it's just a new study, right? They just came out from the University of Hong Kong, you know, that uh, uh, I think, it probably, well, maybe the Chinese foreign minister supposedly haven't read that the study, <laughs> that too obsessed with that warrior, wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, but no time. I think I think we need more deep, more, more details of that study, because my understanding is that the, um, you know, the Sinovac and the Sinopharm are um, much less effective in preventing infection, but highly effective in preventing severe disease. But, um, you know, you have, um, you know, uh, many people in the elderly, of only 50% of the elderly, many of whom have, you know, um, other risk factors, non-communicable diseases, uh, you know, who are um, highly at risk, like 75% of all the global deaths have been to the elderly people over 60. So I think, you know, you've got this particular confluence of risk factors in China that make it only about 50% effective in preventing disease, even while it may be effective in preventing severe disease, you still got a lot of people who aren't vaccinated. So I think you need to dig down more into that study and what happened in Hong Kong, right? Uh, with so many of the elderly dying who were um, immunized with the uh, similar type of vaccine, the killed virus vaccine. So I'm not sure I fully trust that data yet. I think it you have to dig down and provide much more detail. Certainly, you know, um, Yanjong, you and I were at the same event at CFR a few weeks ago where Ian Lipkin from Columbia, I think, um, who is a you know leading world vaccine um, expert, uh, was very um, um, skeptical about the Sinopharm, the Sinovac, based on a study that was done, I believe, in uh, Mongolia or someplace like that. So I, I think we don't I don't want to take that at face value. I think we really need to question, um, you know, the efficacy of the Sinovac, Sinopharm three dose regimen versus uh, boosting with, like, say, the mRNAs, which I think, um, honestly, is the accepted path forward for how China is going to get out of this. So yeah. I'm just just giving you my two cents on that. Yeah, uh, June, you're absolutely right. <laughs> the caveat here is that when we talk about the effectiveness of three doses of the inactive air vaccines. We're talking about the capability, the, the effectiveness in reducing severe cases and death, you know, not to prevent infection. So if you talk about the ability right, to, to prevent infection, even three doses, the inactive vaccine is still not that effective. Yeah. My vaccines. So we might want to say on that. I think one of the big challenges with vaccines in general is that it can be complicated to understand how they work. Um, how well they work, how they work in comparison, and we don't have enough studies to kind of understand that. 
And so this, the data that I showed was for people over 60, so it's looking at the elderly, and it's comparing in terms of the number of doses, and it's just about deaths. So it's not thinking about transmission. Mm -hmm. Those are two right. components of vaccine effect and, um, efficacy. One is deaths, severe disease, and the other is transmission. And so I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding around vaccines are the initial vaccines versus the kind of variants that were circulating um, in the spring of 2021 was very, very high and also reducing the chance of, um, of infection. Now with the new variants, um, it has affected the, uh, the efficacy of those vaccines. We're still using our, our old vaccines for the new variants. And that is something that I've been really pushing for is for um, the population to push the pharmaceutical companies to update their vaccines. They don't want to necessarily update the vaccines. They want to still get paid the same amount for a vaccine that is just, you know, the marginal cost rolling off, rolling out of their factories. But we have new variants, we need new vaccines, and we need to improve our capability of updating our vaccines for the new variants we have now and the ones that are, and, uh, you know, undoubtedly coming on the horizon to be able to, to develop the new vaccine, produce a new vaccine, distribute it. And, and provide boosters. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the boosters. The messaging around boosters in the US has been absolutely terrible and the same thing internationally. So for people to understand the different vaccines, what the booster is for and things like that, the mRNA vaccines are incredibly effective. They are seen as kind of the best, but looking at these other vaccines we have as well, they get discounted pretty easily. So that is data. We, we probably, we definitely need more studies. We want to go back and review that, but that is data from a study um, that is evaluated and they, they really do look um, on par. So maybe there's, there's certainly some bias involved in that study, but it means that the Sino, the Sino, or Sinovac in that case, um, if boosted often enough, um, could potentially keep up with the mRNA vaccines. And then the question is also about cost, um, about um, acceptability, whether people are comfortable with mRNA vaccines, and we do need a broad, a broad set of um, vaccine options available. So I don't want to necessarily discount uh, Sinopharm and Sinovac because we want to look at the um, effectiveness with the boosters. And mRNAs, um, those vaccines, those vaccinations are also waning efficacy. So comparing kind of the initial efficacy of mRNA with what we thought about Sinovac, what really matters is kind of in the long run um, and whether we can boost them and how we can boost them. Okay, let's see if we have other, Maggie, please. Thank you for the very insightful discussion. Um, I cannot help but, you know, wondering if you can Maggie, make- can you tell people who you are? Yes, I'm Maggie Chen. I'm a professor of economics and international affairs here at GW and Alien School. Um, I just cannot help but wondering if you all have a suggestion for China uh, in terms of exit strategy. You know, we know what has happened in the last couple of years, but you know, I, I think everybody wants to know what, what can happen next that you know is um, you know more balanced and less costly um, and without you know a lot of um, health uh, damages, obviously. Well, the, the Chinese government believe that zero COVID is the only correct strategy for dealing with COVID, right? That is the theory, right? The, uh, they want to end that debate. But the, you know, the point you know, is that there is indeed a viable, more cost-effective strategy available compared with uh, the zero COVID strategy, which is extremely costly, uh, which has caused also a lot of this second order or secondary disasters, if you will, right? So by this more you know, like a viable cost-effective approach, I'm talking about right, the uh, mitigation-based strategy that focused on protecting, vaccinating the elderly, right? The administering three doses you know, to uh, the, the, this large elderly population, boost the public health search capacity, right, the, uh, including the expansion of the ICU base, by right, the hospitalization, uh, the capacities right, to uh, admit more patients, and in the meantime, you know, educate the public right, to reduce this fear you know, about the, the, uh, the virus. Because now when the government is doing the opposite, right? basically they're highlighting the danger of COVID-19 at a time we know right, that this uh, overall right, that this virus has become milder. Right, than uh, the, the previous one. Uh, so 
uh, the, uh, there, there is a, you know, this strategy won't be able to prevent uh, what is inevitable, that is, search of the cases, but can minimize the damage by right, causes, you know, to the country when the country opens up to the, uh, to the outside world. And also, uh, the, the, this can uh, significantly reduce by right, the, the damage to the country's economy and also uh, the, 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 uh, the, the society. I agree with Yan Zheng. I agree with Yan Zheng, but I would just say that I think, you know, the strategy is, um, you know, while I agree with you that it's, it's rapidly vaccinating the elderly, only 50% of whom are vaccinated at this point, it's really notable that, I mean, I don't know if you can believe the numbers of 17 deaths in Shanghai, but there are hundreds of thousands of positive cases that are, you know, because of the massive testing that's going on and a very, very tiny percentage of people who are dying, you know, um, are severely ill. And I think it's notable. It's a, it's a statement that China could move away from zero COVID, live with the vaccine, probably, you know, clearly 90, 95% of cases are, are, are asymptomatic, right? And to move to a, um, a, a you know, a, a home testing um, and self-isolation strategy like we have in the United States or other places, I think is part of the way forward given uh, what's going on right now. But I think part of it is gonna have to be, as Yan Zhong says, you know, rapidly spending the money and vaccinating the elderly with whatever effective vaccine, you know, they decide. Um, I just, I do want to point out that I, you know, that China itself has been developing or is in discussions with BioNTech on an mRNA vaccine and whether the, you know, the um, lock is because of intellectual property issues and, you know, Pfizer, BioNTech not wanting to share or for other reasons of protecting its own Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccine, you know, and its profits. I do think, um, you know, when these issues have to be resolved globally in terms of the global public goods of these, these vaccines, you know, versus the profit for the, and patent protections for the different manufacturers, there's so much confusion, so much marketing. I think as Zoe mentioned, you know, who knows, you know, which one is really better? We're going to need longer term studies to really see. But um, there's a lot of, you know, marketing going on in there in the discussion of these vaccines that are preventing, I think, an effective choice and move forward on the best one for, for you know, um, vaccine strategies everywhere. So any ideas on exit strategies? Yeah. I mean, China has demonstrated that it's willing to pay a very, very high cost for a zero COVID strategy. And so I think reallocating those costs um, to, a, to a different strategy is the way out. So I've mentioned kind of more passive policies, the idea about ventilating indoor spaces. That is you know, a massive investment in infrastructure, but that is something that China is definitely capable of and, then, and, and could be a world leader on that type of thing, making indoor spaces safe figuring out the ventilation uh, and also, um, I mean, the behavior change as well, thinking about vaccination. So investing in booster campaigns. So I don't know enough specifically about the vaccination campaigns in China, but uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit with vaccination, innovating on how to get people vaccinated, how to convince people to get vaccinated, um, thinking about that as well. So I think kind of we know what the, we know that the different things that work, we know what the tools that are that work. And so I think China just doing a simple reallocation, um, even alongside pursuing kind of a zero COVID policy, testing out some of these other approaches. Um, but the idea is that there are ways to control COVID and help us get back to normal. And China can really be a world leader on those. Yeah, it is interesting. Can I can I add also that I think the Paxlovid and the treatment is another part of it. You know, also uh, China needs to make those uh, antiretroviral treatments okay. available. Well, what, I, yeah. <laughs> what I want to say is that you know, China is making this PCR testing mandatory. It is making the quarantine mandatory, but it refuses to make the vaccination on the elder mandatory. Good point. Okay, let's see if we can get at least one more question in, Mike. This is actually a bit of a follow-on to- Tell, tell people who you are. Oh, right. I'm sorry. I'm uh, uh, Michael Moore. I'm a professor of economics and national affairs here at, at the Elliott School. So really kind of a follow-on to Maggie's point, the question. So even if 
the government thought that they should change, it seems like politically it would be difficult to, to back down from this. So take COVID aside, would, do the lessons that they have learned suggest that they would treat the next pandemic differently? Or would they think this is the right way regardless of the experience with COVID? I know it's, it's speculative, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah that, that is a great question. You know, in fact, you know, right after the Wuhan outbreak, you know, they started to by the uh, assemble teams, you know, conduct their studies, like draw lessons from the Wuhan outbreak, you know, how to fix the loopholes in the public health system, you know, how to make it more responsive, effective in responding to the next you know, pandemic, should that occur. But what I found interesting that in this discussion, right, that there's no talk about you know, this political aspect of the problem. You know, that when we talk about initial mishandling of the crisis, most of that we know it was political, right? It was institutional. But they, you know, in this redefine the narrative on Chinese pandemic response, all this talk about this initial mishandling of that for outbreak was lost. Right. And I think, as I have pointed out, it's more than 17 years ago, right? If you don't tackle the root cause of the problem, we can see the disaster repeated again, right? Uh, that was when I said that, the, uh, right after the SARS outbreak. I will say that I, um, how countries deal with panda, the ongoing pandemic now is exactly how they'll deal with the next one. So it's the idea that, like, oh, we have to wait, like, we, it, this, this current pandemic is we've done what we could and now it's what are we going to do for the next one I mean we're still in the middle of an ongoing pandemic and there is room to change now and if we are not willing to change now when there's kind of pandemic fatigue and we you know put all of these costs in we're not going to change policy you know as soon as the next pandemic hits we're not going to learn our lessons in between and I think the same thing for China right it's sticking to the zero COVID policy and so let's say this pandemic ends tomorrow and another one starts next year they're not going to start with their new policy if they're still towing the line that their current policy is the best policy. So I can see that there are ways to kind of go about a zero code policy that involve a lot less restrictive means. So kind of these, you know, ventilation over, over lockdowns. So there are ways within the zero code policy to, to shift and to also try out some different types of policies that could be useful um, in, in this ongoing pandemic and down the line. So I don't think this idea about like, oh, do we learn out? If we haven't learned our lesson now, I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna learn it when the next one hits. I would just, can I just say one thing there that I think, you know, I wanna reiterate that, you know, with what Yan Zhong said about what happened after SARS, you know, and I do think that, the world has learned a lot from the response to the SARS pandemic, but we didn't necessarily see it play out. Um, and that was a time of much greater global collaboration, global health collaboration. Um, you know, now we're in this much more competitive geopolitics world where China's much more the enemy and it's been much more difficult for a variety of reasons, China's current regime, uh, the, you know, the, the, politics in the United States to really, um, you know, find the, the places for global collaboration. But, you know, with any new pandemic, you learn as you go. I think China's initial mess, missteps at the beginning of the uh, COVID outbreak, you know, were understandable. If it happened anywhere else, it probably, you know, would have been similar. Uh, but I think we're less forgiving of that because there's less collaboration and ability to engage and learn from those things to put in place the types of responses that we need for the future. So, uh, I, you know, I don't know really what the main point is other than it's much hard that during post-SARS, post -SARS, there was a lot of global collaboration and a lot of learning, a lot of assistance to China and a lot of uh, digesting the experience to put in place policies for what to do next. Um, we're in a less better place in the world to do that at the moment. I just want to add, it's really disappointing right, to see that on both sides, there's less interest, less incentive to cooperate um, global security preparing for the next pandemic. On the US side, you might see basically white like people, you know, there's policymaker legislators saying, well, China is not cooperative on the uh, pandemic regions probe, you know, and if, unless they have become more cooperative, forget about cooperation on any other fronts. On the China side, they were saying, well, you guys did such a void in pandemic response. There's really not much we can learn 
from the United States. You know, they, uh, so the U.S. leverage on China also has been in decline. You know, so and not to mention, right, that, they, that when the, the China's basically say, well, now you're framing this relationship as competition, competition, but you know, you you want to cooperate on certain fronts, but the, we want to make sure, right, the overall relationship is improved first because before we can talk about cooperation on certain specific fronts. 